Stuart Brand came to me because he had heard that I read catalogs. He said, I want to make this a thing called the Whole Earth Catalog so that anyone on Earth can pick up a telephone and find out the complete information on anything. He said, that's my goal. That if people have good information, they will do the right thing. Catalog took a definitely counter countercultural relationship with technology, and we went out of our way to not only become smart about technology, but to take over the control of it and invent our own. Here's making books. Here's um, direct use of the sun's energy. Here's the Heathkit catalog, which uh, included uh, building your own computer. Here was the uh, medical manual. Here was land for sale back then. I was everybody was looking for land. Here's a recreational equipment catalog, REI back you know back then. Here's a book on hot springs. Here was a book by, by uh, Richard Brodigan on trout fishing in America. Here was um, a book on science experiments for everyone. Here was the Edmund Scientific catalog, which I loved. So this this came out and it just it just struck everybody as the most wonderful thing.
How can we ask anyone else in the world to arrive at agreements if we can't? We need to find what can get us to all feel right about doing a thing. It's not to exclusion of anything else. It's just where we're going to plant this particular seed. This money should be used to establish a permanent essay and speech contest. Now, the only responsibility we have as children of white middle class America is to the people we ripped off, and that was the Indians. And I think this money should be used, most of it should be used to get all the Jews out of Miami and get the Puerto Ricans back where they belong. We have all of these ideas in competition with each other, and you have the problem, Peace. along with me and everybody else, of deciding what to do with this goddamn money. Focus your fucking energy! You've got nine million suggestions, they're all good, pick one! This could go on for the next fucking year! But every single idea that came up, a sort of a commitment, got made to it. And I have a strong suspicion that some people who came up and spoke for an idea and went away without the money still went away with the idea in a way that they hadn't come in regards. So that they went away with a kind of momentum just because we put this thing up and got that kind of conversation going.
Jay Baldwin is an author, teacher, machinist, and technological fence tester. As an editor of the Whole Earth Catalog, he has been in the information center of a 25-year-long design revolution. Living and working out of an Airstream trailer, pulled by a truck he calls his universal toolbox, Jay crisscrosses the country, assisting in the realization of experiments on the ecological frontier. When Fuller remarked that good hardware was one of the few irrefutable proofs of clear thinking, I took that to heart. It's an old adage, actually, that tools are extensions of your body, and like pliers are just very strong fingers, and a hammer is just a very hard fist, but I found that a whole group of tools is an extension of your mind, uh, and it enables you to, to bring your ideas into uh, physical form and actually what you're doing is you're adding so much energy to the idea that other people can see it. Proof of concept work is what gets done in here. I call this place a three-dimensional sketch pad. You find that not very many people are living their life the way you're living and I look around me and I see very few people my age especially are living the kind of life that I'm living. But I regard my life as an experiment and it's experiment that has not, the, the result has not always been wonderful, but I certainly wouldn't say that anything is unsuccessful because you always learn from it. After you discover what sort of human being is being tried with your particular genetic makeup, then you should drive that just as far as you can to see what it's good for. And I think that's your responsibility. And I think also that it is the responsibility of designers, people acting as designers, to carry out their ideas all the way to the point of living in them so that you don't go home at five o'clock, that you live in what you're doing, which is kind of an ultimate proof. You don't, you don't hire somebody else to do your living for you. It's not a simulation that you're actually doing the deed yourself. So you become the world's expert on whatever it is you're doing. And you look around you and you can say, there's really not anybody I can ask for advice. And then you know you're doing okay. The advantage that a design outlaw has is of just going dead at something instead of having to cycle all of the thoughts and ideas and potential usages, some through institution or other. Uh, this is a person who's just figuring out what would be nifty to do next with what's available in the way of tools. The responsibility of the designer is the, of the outlaw and the, the, th the outlaw thinker is certainly to try to reach forward beyond the restrictions of today, beyond the stupidities of the, of the current political situation, whatever that may be, of the current way things are done, and say, God, how should we really be doing this? 
the world will often think of them as being completely mad, and the world may be right, but we need them like hell because they are the ones who give us the fresh insights and the fresh ideas and the fresh ways of looking at things. I, I've been able to live now for almost a half century on the frontier without anybody uh, guaranteeing me anything or telling me what to do. I've learned how to survive there, and one of the things I do is never to try to persuade anybody to, I don't try to, you don't try to sell anything. You, you uh, see what needs to be done and you do it. This program is about hackers, the computer wizards who in just a decade created both a multi-billion dollar industry and a cultural phenomenon. A hacker never finishes a program. A hacker will get to a point where a program does something and maybe take a deep breath and say, how can I make it do this? How can I make it do that? And it'll just keep working. And the hacker often won't shut off the computer until he collapses at the keyboard or something. They do not have so much the normal friends to distract them, other activities to go to. They don't generally have girlfriends. Anything that's going to need a large attachment commitment of their time, the computer is it and only it. They are uh, shy, sweet, incredibly brilliant, and uh, I think more effective in pushing the culture around now in good ways than almost any group I can think of. Next. Uh, my name's Andrew Hertzfeld. I bought and fell in love with an Apple II in 1978, went to work for Apple in 1979, and was lucky enough to help design the Macintosh. Andy Hertzfeld is perhaps the best example of the modern-day hacker, driven by the same pure spirit as his predecessors, yet working within a commercial framework. He designed his latest hack in one weekend, just in time for the conference. My uh, hack for the Hackers Conference is this uh, program that allows you to switch very quickly between programs on the Mac. And I have it set up here so you can uh, switch between them in uh, less than a second's worth of time. Late in the night, another vision of the future came true at the conference. This bizarre hack had one side of the audience compete against the other by averaging the action of the player's joysticks to make them play as one turning an ordinary video game into an unusual team sport. Outside the beaten path, at the cutting edge of new technology, the hacker spirit lives on. Well, it's a place that you can drop in on uh, while you're sitting there at your computer at any time. The well was just uh, throwing some people and some equipment together to see what would happen. We didn't really have an idea what we wanted the well to be. Enjoyment, information, communication, contact with other people. I've made friends, I've gotten job connections. between a telephone conversation and a letter. So you end up being in some ways more personal because you can't see who you're talking to. And other times, it's kind of a strange dynamic. going to be a real important kind of phenomenon. I think there are going to be a lot of communities like this.
We suddenly have, for the first time, a type of reality that combines the kind of limitlessness of content that you normally associate only with internal experiences like dreams, combines that with the objectivity of the physical world. And that blend is the thing that's stunning about virtual reality. I have a great hope. Uh, and VR is part of my scheme. And my hope is that we can save the world by connecting it to its past. Everybody take your bag now and put it on. Let your lips uh, gently touch the brown paper. Slip it down over your lips. And then you do the funny mantra. Ready? Uh, let's just do it. One, two, three. Go for it. One again. One, two, three. Go for it. Lewis and Jane said they were going to make a real magazine about computers that wasn't boring. And they had the exact recipe for Wired, which was big idea, real people, marry it into chronicle of our times. Wired magazine was primarily a magazine that we were writing for ourselves. And we knew that what we were talking about and interested in would be what everybody else would be interested in later on. The stories that we were running were about how technology impacted the society and how it might change our behavior. Wired is still relevant because it's a magazine about the culture of technology and there's nothing else that's talking about it at that level. But actually, the surprising thing to me is how 
still vital and unique wired is because it's talking about the consequences of technology. Uh, our city is saturated with ritual. And people don't talk about that. They talk about how wild and crazy it is, how pushing boundaries, how it's innovating, engine of innovation, and all this stuff. And, and I guess that's radical enough, pushing boundaries, going where no one's been, the new. But it's really about also, in equal force, the old. It's about the other side of what, rich, what radical means. Radical means pushing boundaries, but it's a very funny word. Its root is radix, which means root. And it, you know, radical, the word, also means whatever is deeply situated in our nature, what, 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 what is innate, what, what, what is soulful, what is interior. It means both those things at once, and our city means both those things at a time. I keep wondering if people will finally ask me, why all this radical expression and radical self-reliance, what's all this radical stuff in the principles, what does that mean? Well, it, 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 in some sense it means that. that. People can live in the moment there, but at the same time they, they do so in, 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 in contemplation of, of, of continuities of time that extend all the way back you know, to the beginning, say your birthday, when you came into this world as a being, and all the way forward, potentially, into the future, and that future that, 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 that if you live long enough, then you very much hope to affect. Think about the next 10,000 years. Think about the last 10,000 years. That's what we call the long now. The Long Now Foundation started in 1996. To get people thinking seriously about the future. And our collective responsibility to those distant generations. Today, our foundation has thousands of members from all across the globe. Monument scale projects and micro scale projects and hundreds of hours of talks by leading experts. All aimed at helping us seriously discuss the next 10,000 years. And our place within the long now. My name is Danny Hillis, and I'm building a clock that will last for 10,000 years. When I had been a kid, the future had been out in the year 2000. Even when it got to be in the 1990s, we were still sort of just imagining what the year 2000 would be like. It was almost as if the future had been shrinking my entire life. Danny Hillis sent around an email that he wanted to build a clock that would last 10,000 years. What? 10,000 year clock? Why? Danny had been building some of the fastest supercomputers in the world. He was pretty much the golden boy of MIT. Everybody wanted to do things faster and faster and faster. I needed to slow down, stretch out, think on a different time scale. Any engineer, of course, wants to build something that lasts. But that doesn't mean it's easy to build. How do you make rolling elements that last for 10,000 years? The clock is built out of gears and levers and things that Galileo would have understood. One of the ways we keep the clock accurate is to synchronize it to the sun. That requires a lens like this big around out of course. Then, exactly at solar noon, the chimes begin to play. The chime generator was developed by Brian Eno. They worked out a way of ringing 10 bells in a different sequence each day for 10,000 years. From the very beginning, I wanted to be able to make a little model of the clock. Our original prototype clock. And then make a bigger one, and make a bigger one, and make a bigger one. I realized that the clock couldn't go into a building it had to be in a mountain. In trying to design a 10,000 year clock, we're invested in generational thinking and hoping to kind of answer the question, are we being good ancestors? There is a problem of people not believing in the future. A long-term clock challenges those short-term civilizational stories. 
I'm very optimistic about the future. I'm not optimistic because I think our problems are small. I'm optimistic because I think our capacity to deal with problems are great. Reviving and restoring woolly mammoths and their climate-stabilizing mammoth step is the most spectacular wildlife project that Ryan Phelan and I have taken on for our California nonprofit called Revive and Restore. And thanks to George Church's marvelous team, it is the farthest along in terms of actually editing genes from an extinct species into the genome of a living relative. What they're doing is brilliant breakthrough science and therefore exactly the kind of high-visibility, proof-of-concept example that will show conservation biologists and the general public what a potent new toolkit biotech is bringing to wildlife conservation. The extinction is dramatic, but it represents only a small part of the benefits that genomic technology can bring to wildlife conservation. Many remnant populations of animals in the wild and in captive breeding programs are facing what is called an extinction vortex. Many wild populations of animals and plants are profoundly threatened by exotic diseases. In normal times, wild populations would evolve around such problems, but humans are introducing so many challenges so rapidly that evolution doesn't have time to generate the needed adaptations. Conservation biologists call what we are doing facilitated adaptation. It consists of careful genomic analysis, then minimal gene tweaking, followed by sustained monitoring at every level from ecosystem to individual gene. The goal is to restore ecological biodiversity via precisely enhanced genomic biodiversity. At Revive and Restore, we find that people come for the mammoths, but they stay for the ferrets and frogs and trees and birds that need help right now. Climate change is not a sudden event. It's not a thing that is caused by governments. It's not a thing that's going to be solved just by governments. It's solved by basically everybody deciding, we caused it, we got to fix it. Everybody, all together. Whole goddamn civilization. of The whole goddamn planet. And thinking as a planet is what climate change is forcing us to do. Thinking as a civilization rather than just a society or a nation, but as a civilization. People in the century get to live in a century where humanity discovers itself as the keeper of life now on a whole planet. What an amazing realization, what an amazing job, what an amazing thing to work out, how that actually works. But all the tools are in place to do that, to make it Earth National Park and the city that you want to live in and the society that continues to become ever more amazing from year to year and decade to decade in a non-destructive way. What's going to happen in this century?